John Cook's Newsmaker Saturday starts now. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Saturday. This week on the program, the entire program, my sit-down interview with U.S. Attorney General William Barr, recorded this week in Phoenix during a trip to talk about methamphetamine and trying to crack down on that drug. Here is my conversation, wide-ranging, with William Barr. Mr. Attorney General, thank you very much for being with us. We appreciate your time. My pleasure. What brought you to Phoenix? I know we're talking about methamphetamine distribution, and, and unfortunately, Phoenix is a hub. That's right. Uh, what brought me to Phoenix uh, is exactly that, methamphetamine, the increase we're seeing around the country, the trafficking of methamphetamine. It's a drug that's associated with a lot of violence as well as real damage to the individual addicts and uh, we have to respond to it. And today, we were talking about this program that the DEA has to dismantle the trafficking uh, operations in the United States. There are about nine cities that serve as hubs for distribution. The cartels get the bulk product up into these cities and then distribute it around the country. And we're trying to uh, intercept it in these cities and take down the organizations that are playing that role in the distribution chain. This is mostly Americans, not Mexican nationals, at the retail level. Okay, yeah. this is at the retail level. Yeah, but there are there are Mexicans involved in in getting it up into the hubs. So, and it's also working both sides of the border. Uh, but this part of the exercise is really focused on the hub cities, and Phoenix is a hub, unfortunately. Right. Let me ask you, um, we're, we're heading into election, we're, we're some 50 days out. Mm -hmm. uh, how concerned are you that no matter who wins, that you will have half of the electorate that will not accept the outcome? I mean, have we wargamed this as to what might happen if people don't accept a result of the election? You know, I, I haven't been involved in wargaming it, but, you know, even before uh, some of the proposals and some of the actions of the states, uh, started taking sh shape when I was first in my confirmation hearing uh, back in uh, January uh, 2018. Uh, I, I said that the thing our country has going for us uh, is the peaceful transition of power which people accept the legitimacy of the transfer. Uh, I also have said that you know the two things in our system whereby we resolve things are talk and voting. We've done away with talk to some extent. People aren't talking to each other. There's sort of monolithic media that sort of puts out the, the narrative of the day. Or cancel culture. Cancel culture, correct. Uh, so people talk, even if there's talking, it's passing each other. But we still have the peaceful transfer of power. And I was saying that uh, we have to be very careful that we protect the integrity of elections. Everything should be focused on winning popular support for the integrity of elections. And I'm afraid that some of the reforms, the idea of mass mailing out of ballots and things, are going to raise, are going to raise questions about coercion and fraud. We're told repeatedly that there is no reason to worry about mail-in voting, that it's secure, that the, the, the people who have, who have messed around with the system are few and far between. We're told that it's on the up and up. Do you share that view or are you very concerned about it? No, I don't share the view. I'm very concerned. And the media has, the mass media has deliberately uh, uh, obscured the real question. The question isn't about absentee ballots where a voter requests a ballot, obtains the ballot, and, and casts Which it. Which is what we do here in Arizona. Right. And most states have provision for absentee voting like that. What we're talking about here is the idea of universal mail-in ballots where they just send out, whether someone's requested it or not, uh, some people uh, a ballot, all the people on the, on the, on the uh, election list, which we know from experience uh, there are a lot of people who are no longer qualified on that list. As I've said publicly, I have friends who left California 21 years ago, living in another part of the country, they still receive California ballots by mail. But if they filled that ballot out, what would happen? Do you suspect it would be counted? I suspect it would be counted. But, but uh, so, uh, you know, I am worried about uh, th this idea of universal mail-in, mail-out ballots uh, by the state where people are not requesting them. One thing I've pointed out is that look at the system we have now and why do we have it the way we have it. People go to a definite precinct where their name's on a list, they identify themselves, they go into the poll, 
close a curtain, secret ballot, no one is allowed in, in with them. Why? Well, it's to avoid coercion, vote buying, vote selling, and fraud. Uh, they're there for a reason. Now, what happens when you have mass mail-out ballots? All of those are lost. There's no longer secret ballot. The chain of custody of that ballot is broken. Right. Well, Potentially. All, not only that, but people have to identify themselves and how, it, because you can associate how they voted with a name. So it's no longer secret. Uh, there's breaking of the chain. You can't, uh, you can't police against undue influence or coercion. Do you worry that for the sake of convenience, we have undermined the sanctity of the vote? I, it's not just convenience. I think there's, you know, I think that there are uh, political reasons that people want to loosen the safeguards. And I think people have to start thinking about the fact that uh, when you lose integrity of the vote and you loosen the safeguards, you are endangering the sanctity of each person's vote. You uh, were Attorney General under Bush 41, a much different political climate. Mm -hmm. Can you describe why in the world you would have wanted to jump in, back in, at this time, with this president, who is a polarizing figure? Why did you want to get back in? Well, I, I wouldn't say I wanted to get back in. Uh, I was very happy uh, with my, I, I was quasi-retired. I had spent many years in, in the private sector and in, in major corporations. I was on the board of major companies. Uh, and uh, I was doing some consulting when a, when a project interested me. Uh, and so I had a very good life. I was very happy. I had no intention of going back into government. But uh, I think there was a, a crisis uh, in government. I think that the uh, Department of Justice was being used as a political football. I thought it, it was being damaged as an institution. And uh, I wanted to, uh, you know, I proposed other people. I was consistently asked, you know, will, would you come in? And I was suggesting others. But it, uh, when Sessions made it clear that when, he, when it was clear he was leaving, the question was really put to me, and I decided I, I had had to do it. I did it essentially because I love the Department of Justice. I think it's a critical institution and I thought I was in a position to lead it and I've said uh, one of the reasons I think I was in a position to lead it is because I'm not looking for anything after this. I'm re I was retired. I'm happy uh, in my do, private life. Do you believe <clears throat> that there was a concerted effort by the intelligence community to undermine this president? You mean before the election in 2016? And even after? Well, I do think there was a, I, I do think that there was a, uh, as I said, I've said, I think that there was unjustified spying on the Trump campaign, uh, and uh, we're looking into the motivations of that. And then afterward, I think one of the most appalling things in history was an effort to uh, carry out a counterintelligence investigation against the president and his administration. Uh, based on, w without any basis whatsoever, and we're, we're trying to determine exactly what the motivations were there. Durham's investigation, you obviously have a sense of it. Mm -hmm. um, do you believe that we will have some resolution before the election? And do you have any sense yet of where this might lead? Uh, I, you know, I, I'm getting a sense of, of the whole story, and I, I've said there's sort of two aspects to this, finding out what happened, and then there's another question, which is, uh, did anyone cross any lines in the course of that activity and violate criminal law, which is something you have to be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt uh, before you can charge it. And so, we're, you know, we're, we're looking at both of those aspects of it. I think the American, and I've said, the American people will get the full story from Durham, and if, and if people cross the line and committed a crime, uh, then uh, the charges will be brought. Let's talk for a minute about policing. Um, we have kind of dodged some of this in Phoenix. Other cities have not been so fortunate. This idea that there is systemic racism within policing in America, do you buy it? No, I don't believe that, and I, I, I'm not even sure what they mean by systemic racism. It became a buzzword when the traditional uh, aspects of racism, they couldn't point to it, uh, you know, very, very easily uh, in the sense that uh, our institutions have largely been reformed over the past 60 years, 
and are no longer de, de jure, you know, legally discriminatory. They are non-discriminatory, and if anything, they have built into them a mechanism to make sure that they don't discriminate. So I think our institutions generally are not discriminatory. Are there individuals who are? There are probably individuals. There are individuals in the country that may have some uh, racial animus, and sometimes that may manifest itself, but we quick, quickly can, can deal with that. But the idea that police are out hunting down black men on the street. No, I don't think that, I don't, I, I don't think police go looking uh, for confrontation, uh, looking for situations that endanger their lives. Uh, I think they, they are carrying out the mission of protecting and serving the public and but by, by definition of their job they get into these very difficult situations with, with hostile suspects. Rochester, Dallas, Seattle, you have high-profile African-American police chiefs who have done exactly what you would want the system to do, put the best people in the best job, and if they're of color, fine, that's great. And they're resigning because they don't feel they're being supported by their political operation. How troubled are you by that, that we're seeing a lot of resignations of police and, and some of them police chiefs of color? Yes, many of them very talented leaders uh, of color in the police community. Uh, I'm very troubled by it. I think it, uh, I think it is demoralizing uh, to those police forces. I think it's generally demoralizing to police to see political leaders that don't have the internal moxie to stand by their law enforcement. They're fundamentally politically political cowards. Eventually they should pay the price for it. Uh, the protests that have gone on. Is there a tripwire for the president, for government, to move into cities who don't really welcome our help? Um, is, there a, is there a point where you say, we need to go in? And what is that point? Okay. So I just want to make clear that we're talking about there are two different things. One is fighting crime traditional crime and, and supporting local law enforcement with various anti-crime initiatives. We don't need anyone's permission to do that. We'll do that, uh, whether people invite us in or not. But s state and local law enforcement like working with federal law enforcement. What if, what if that goes into Antifa, for instance? No, but then the second set of okay. issues don't relate to, you know, the traditional you know, gang bangers and drug organizations and so on. We're talking about civil unrest. We're talking about violent, uh, violence, public violence. Uh, and obviously, Portland is a special circumstance. The people there don't seem to, uh, right now, seem to want us. The political leadership has not uh, asked for our help. Uh, some limited assistance. Uh, yeah, the answer to your question is there are tripwires. There are circumstances under which uh, I think that we would feel compelled uh, to to go in. These uh, citizens there are U.S. citizens. They're citizens of the federal government. We do have an obligation to uphold the Constitution and their and their civil liberties. So there are tripwires. What about in a situation like Chicago, where you have young people, primarily of color, being killed by gun violence? Is that could that be a pretext to say, you know what? we need to go in there and stop this because nobody's stopping it. No, we are. So that's what I'm saying. Those kinds of, that, that crime, we don't need permission because, and, and have traditionally not received commission, uh, permission because uh, federal law applies across every square foot of the country where you have dual sovereigns. We will go in to enforce federal law, law on guns, law on drugs, law on criminal organization. But as I say, there's, I, I can't think of a city where the law enforcement people, the police, the sheriffs, wouldn't want us in there to help them. Uh, so we are going yeah. into and, are in and we are in Chicago. Yeah. We sent 400 uh, agents into Chicago. We gave them uh, the violence went down. Yes, we went. We gave them 12.5 million dollars uh, to bring in more police to work with us. Uh, and uh, crime, uh, homicides have dropped by 50 percent in the first uh, few weeks of our, of our uh, operation. Back in a moment with Attorney General William Barr.